welcome to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, Specialist Payroll Recruiters. Welcome to the Payroll Podcast. Today, I am joined by Martin Stockton, a highly experienced CIPD qualified global payroll and HR outsourcing professional with over 25 years experience in international HR and payroll management. In addition to his operational expertise, Martin is in the enviable position of also possessing significant experience in program and project management on both domestic and international projects involving shared services, change management, sales and pre-sales, and that encompasses both ERP and SaaS cloud-based solutions, outsourcing and consulting, and advising, transformation, implementation and management-based projects. Martin was trained in project management by IBM and assisted in the IBM sales school, He was trained by Workday in setup and configuration in February 2012 and has since implemented payroll and HR solutions worldwide. That includes taking the IBM concepts of HR transformation to market and building a consulting practice around it. Currently, Martin is working for PayAsia as a director, but he is responsible for developing and managing sales and channels and partnerships in Europe for the business. Prior to his current role, Martin has held senior global payroll and HR posts at leading brands, including Specsavers, Safeguard World International, Sony Electronics, and even the Chartered Institute of Payroll Management, or for those more familiar, the CIPP. Interestingly, Martin has also developed a robotics solution for HCM payroll for a major robotics provider, and he has since advised two clients on robotics strategy for payroll. With robotics being a clear subject of interest amongst payroll professionals right now, and very much a hot topic, it's across these areas that we will really be focusing our conversations today in this Payroll Podcast. So without further ado, welcome, Martin, to the Payroll Podcast. How are you doing? I'm good, Nick. Thanks very much for that glowing uh, introduction. <laughs> it's very good. Thank you. My pleasure. Five quick questions. Let's jump straight in. Tell us a little bit more about your journey into payroll, because you've been in it for now for, for over 25 years, and how it's led to you to your current role at PayAsia. I started off, I did my postgrad in, in what used to be called personal management, uh, in a long time before it be called, um, HCM or, or HR even, and worked in that for, uh, several years. As, as you said, you know, I launched, uh, human capital transformation at IBM. I took it to market, but, uh, I think it was about 2000 and 2003, I met a company that was working or introducing payroll into the global market and immediately, I saw the benefits of the organization that were always a hard sell in HR transformation. And I, I sort of switched horses and became much more interested in being able to work on the tangible as opposed to, opposed to the intangible, which in many ways HR transformation really is. It's, it's often very difficult to put the cost benefit analysis on the implementation of a software for HR, but where payroll, you know, you, it's much easier to build a business case. And as a result, you know, that opened lots of career doors for me. Uh, and I really, really find Working in the global payroll environment, uh, really, really interesting. My, you know, my payroll credibility goes back to, uh, you know, working for Oracle and implementing payroll for Litchfield District Council back in 1992 or some whatever it was. So I know what local payroll is like, but also the international payroll is much, much more interesting for me. So having done that, I, my career tr- track changed over into shared services, uh, advisory work on payrolls, and uh, working in payroll technology and currently working for Pay Asia, which is an organization run by some people I met many, many years ago and worked for when I was with, in Converge. It's great people. And working for the people you like is, is very, very important for me at my age. And I think it should be for everybody else. So working in, in the Asian payroll market is very, very different than working in uh, the UK or the domestic payroll market. And I find it very interesting, very challenging, great product, great solution, and great company. Right. And PayAsia are headquartered in Singapore. Is that right? So they're kind of the leading provider. We're headquartered in Singapore. Um, we are listed on the um, Australian Stock Exchange. We went public in May last year. Very successfully. Company is doing very, very well. I'm 6,000 miles away from head office, but I don't feel like I'm alone. Um, you know, in constant communication with head office and we have a very diverse mix of employees all the way around the world that, that all work very well together as a team. And it's very, um, you know, enjoyable. And I've worked in you know, companies that are local in the UK and not felt part of something. So it's great to be in a company that you can actually feel part of that has a really, really good solution. 
Sure. And I know you said in your introduction, you started your career in HR, but you've kind of come across a little bit yeah. more into the payroll market. I know that you like the, I guess, the more binary approach to payroll, that either it works or it doesn't. You have quite an interesting story about uh, where that passion, I guess, kicked off for you with a, with a certain global payroll that went wrong in, in Namibia. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I was working for, a, I'm not going to name the company. If anybody looks <laughs> at my LinkedIn, I might guess who it is. But I, I worked for a company, you know, that had several horror stories about payroll in the old days. No, I'm talking back in the sort of early 90s. But, um, you know, one case, um, when the payroll was launched in South Africa, the first customer, or one of the first customers was uh, some sort of mine in Namibia. The payroll fell. People couldn't get paid in cash, so the, the workers burnt the mine down. When you realize just how important payroll is to the organization, as, as I said, you know, if your succession planning system fails, people still get paid. Sure. Um, but if your payroll system can't, uh, then it's not. And, and I, as I said, I think I think it's really important to be able to look at what's tangible about the global payroll. You know, I've talked to companies and said, how many payrolls do you have around the world? And, and they say, oh, we've got 100 different payrolls. And I, I know when I dig under the surface, I find the figures close to 150. Mm. So that means you've got a very good reason and business case for transforming the whole of the global payroll landscape. That in itself is very, very challenging. Is looking at how it can be delivered, how the cost benefit case can be measured up uh, to the business case. And that I think is, is much more interesting for me. I, I really find that challenging and interesting. We've known each other for a number of years, um, going back to the days that I've been in payroll recruitment. And something you mentioned to me before was that you feel that people or the, the Asian market sell it better potentially or the Asian solution better than the Western market might do. Can, can you talk us a little bit more about their approach and how it differs? It's not quite the case of mates rates, but if you're an Asian company, you know, you work with it within a, a sort of closed network of other Asian suppliers that in many ways they help each other out. They don't compete against each other so much. So the rates tend to be very, very different. I remember last year um, in this current role, um, I was talking to one company. We were looking at potentially putting a partnership in place, and they said, "Well, let's look at some pricing. We'll give you the pricing that we got from some a big company, yeah. and compare it to yours. And our pricing, you know, I took the the medium, the average pricing we could look at putting in place, and our pricing was cheaper by three hundred percent by wow. one of the big guys that operate." in the global marketplace as opposed to the sort you know the asian marketplace and I've, I've actually spoken to a couple of ceos you know in the payroll so we all talk to each other in many many ways and they've had the same feeling is that that you know if you're working for a western company or a global company and you're approaching an asian company quite often you get not robbed but you get an, a higher rate than you might normally get sure uh, if you're just a domestic Asian company. So I'm finding when we do our pricing, it actually becomes a lot more competitive. And when you're working in the Asian environment, you know, you, you guarantee the compliance working through a Singaporean based company, the data standards are, are extremely strict, probably stricter than they are in the UK. And it just becomes a lot, lot easier to price a deal, to work with a company that has that hardcore local knowledge, is able to deal with the smaller companies and smaller countries. In a page of point of view, we've just opened an office in Myanmar. We you now have an office in, in Thailand. You know, and some of the big guys would say, yeah, so what? But for an Asian company, that's a pretty good achievement. And looking at it from the Japanese point of view, where the, the, there seems to be a big focus in Japan for payroll at the moment. And we actually have a, a, a joint venture partnership in Japan now, rather than just having a, you know, a, a subsidiary or an ICP arrangement. It's much, much easier to have an equal arrangement with a leading company that then becomes you know, ingrained into our own offering. And uh, we're finding that's working very, very well for us as well. So that, you know, hello, Pay Asia Japan. Fantastic. That's great environment to work in. It's very challenging. You know, working in Asia in some ways like working in Europe, the countries all um, are in the same geography, but, you know, they all have their own individual nuances and cultures. But uh, I'm a firm believer in that if you're in, in the Asian environment, then it's much, much easier to work with other Asian countries and companies than it is if you're in the Western environment. And I, many years ago, I opened an office in Singapore and Hong Kong for uh, one of the other companies I worked for. And it was almost like pushing water uphill in many, many ways. But because, I, you know, physically we're Western and we're, we're moving into a new market. But when you're an Asian company, it's a lot, lot easier to work in that basis. So, you know, I can take advantage of that from being in, ensconced in Europe. And I find that very enjoyable. Sure. Fantastic. Well, obviously... One of the things we come across a lot in global payroll is the, the challenging, different complexities in relation to compliance. Every global payroll is different. 
one of the earlier podcasts I did with, uh, with Doug Wolf and Mary Holland was talking about the uh, the complexities, the global complexity survey in terms of you know how hard different countries are to run. So at PayAsia, how many how many countries are you servicing, and what are the difficult challenges that you're facing at the moment when it comes to providing local or multi country payroll services and compliance? Well, to be honest, we operate in every Asian country except North Korea. How many countries that is, I'm not entirely sure. We're moving into Africa now and also in the Middle East. Uh, you know, I think it's quite easy to do as long as you have the right technology in place and you have the right people responsible for compliance. I don't think it's necessarily difficult. You just have to be aware that some areas of Asia have a, how can I put it, a stronger desire or aptitude for corruption than you would normally get in the European environment. Sure. But, you know, payroll is one thing that if, you, if you're working with payroll, you, you know, you're working with and have to prove through international standards that you are compliant. So you, you are driven to guarantee the compliance for your customers, which guarantees, as I said, it makes it easy to guarantee compliance, but also um, you're not working with fly-by-night organizations that, are, that supply payroll on your behalf and you've got no idea how to manage those. We have a compliance team that, that is locally based that manages this. And as I said, you know, we're opening offices in Thailand and Myanmar, uh, which makes it a lot easier than just using you know, telephone or internet to work with a third party. Yeah, sure. Well, that makes sense. Five technical questions. Well, listen, one area I'm really keen to explore in more detail in this episode of the Payroll Podcast is very much centered around automation, uh, robotics, yeah. and of course, AI or artificial intelligence. I say this because you're quite an expert in this field, Martin, and I wondered, therefore, if you could tell the listeners, let's take it right down to its, uh, to its basic terms. Can you tell the listeners what the key differences are first between automation, robotics, and AI? <laughs> well, it's step one, step two, and step three. <laughs> Firstly, I would say this is not it the first environment I've ever worked in where there's been a body of thought about something, but actually not not a lot of product okay. to be able to refer it to. It's like saying, we must have aeroplanes. Will somebody please invent one? Sure, sure. So if you're looking at automation, you, you had a lot of that through, you know, the, the workflow in the earlier days, although workflow wasn't necessarily intuitive in any sense. And, and then a lot of automation went into what we call screen scraping which is basically replicating keystrokes in a program. That started to take off, but I think the markets moved past that. Into the robotic sense, that's where you have a series of smaller robots operating in your environment for you. And I don't mean you know the, the Cybermen, Doctor Who type thing. These are software robots. Robots work inside the box. So it's very easy for a robot to, to perform a series of preconditioned and pre-programmed tasks that involve, please input this, please check this out. If this is not correct, rewrite this, put an email to this, send approval for this. If it's the pay increase is more than 10%, please refer this to somebody else for approval, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's always got to be a manual override for a robot and a manual sign-off, but robots can, in fact, work much more closely with humans to work through the standard processes in a payroll environment. I'm, I'm really only going to talk from a payroll here, Nick, because... Yeah, no, that's fine. That's a payroll audience. It's but, you know, one or two customers I work with, and I remember one I said, well, you know, what happens if you uh, if you don't pay employees enough? And, and the payroll head of payroll said, oh, employees shout. I said, well, what happens if you don't, if you overpay and she said to me, we never know. We never find out if we actually overpay people. And I thought from a payroll point of view, you know, that's going to get hit on audit. But wouldn't it be lovely if you had some form of control in your system that said, oh, yeah, just a moment, this employee has been given an increase of 100%. Is this right? Because the policy is only to never to give more than 10% or something like that. I had one customer where an ICP was actually making changes to payroll on behalf of the customer, which, you know, if, if you had a robotic process right through the beginning of the payroll cycle, the errors that were, were being corrected by the ICP would have been picked up right at the very beginning sure. of the payroll cycle. So, you know, robotics helps drive compliance, but it also, I think something that's very, very important is if, you know, in a typical payroll department, you have your peaks and your troughs and, you know, you have the middle piece of your payroll cycle where not a lot is happening and then it gets towards the, closing off the period and the workload picks up. Uh, well, using robotics allows you to manage the task and the payroll quite consistently and constantly through the payroll cycle. You know, the old cliche is, is 
oh, well, that means we could get rid of some people. Uh, and, da, 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 da. and I also argue with people, well, actually means you could take more work on sure. uh, with the same people as opposed to doing that. So, you know, some organizations uh, can be horrified of that till, they, till they're told the alternatives are, well, if you do this and you do this, these are the full-time equivalents you ha- you now have spare. You would now be able to work on some of these added value tasks that you've not been able to work on previously. And then all little lights come on and, and then people stop to worry about their jobs and think about how much value they can add to the payroll function. Sure. Now, without gilding the lilies, I think I've mentioned this a few times in previous podcast episodes, but ultimately it's not jobs that are going to be automated. It's the tasks within jobs that are going to be automated. Yes, that's right. It's the simple repetitive tasks within the payroll life cycle. The intervention uh, has still got to be signed off by humans. But, you know, in a typical shared service environment, you've got your tier zero, which would be your normally your employee self-service, send an email in using uh, a chatbot. You can cut the SLA down from 24 hours down to, you know, instant return by the robot telling you how many days holiday you've got left in the system, as opposed to getting an email saying we will get back to you within 24 hours. And then tier one would be typically the generalists. And then you've got tier two, obviously, the specialists. Same old, you know, yeah, sure. same old pyramid. But I've actually written an illustration of this that I can share with you later. It's like, it's not like having the shard ensconced within a pyramid. If yep. you can imagine, you know, you've got the shard with a, with a thin point and, and a thinner body, but you've got a pyramid, which has got a very broad body. It, it works out 70, 20, 10% of the tier one, tier two, tier three roles that you can actually use for other product, other, other tasks by eliminating within a robotics environment in apparel. Great. Well, if you, if you could share that um, with me, that'd be great. I can uh, make that available in the episode notes. Yeah. Brilliant. So at the moment then, uh, Martin, what are the general market philosophies in relation to automation robotics from a solutions point of view? So what are the sort of main differences between what the suppliers are currently offering in terms of robotic solutions? Well, you have to wade through the, the, the marketing spin to get to the truth on this, to be honest. I've done a couple of selection processes for some of the last organizations I work with. And, you know, one of the questions I always put in the RFI, RFP is what's your philosophy on uh, automation, robotics and AI? And quite often I get, uh, we're not going to tell you. And one yeah. company said, oh, we don't have one because we don't think it works. And I'm like, all right, well, show me something. And I, I get nothing back. And I, I remember several years ago visiting uh, one very, very well-known company. And i just come out of working in a robotics environment. And I said, well, show me what you've got. And I looked at it. I thought, I don't know who that's going to benefit, but it certainly isn't going to be the customer. Sure. So a lot, of, a lot of the activity and work I've seen with some of the suppliers I've had dealings with the past few years has been looking at their internal processes, but not actually looking at how that can benefit the customer. And you look at it from, from their point of view. I can understand about keeping, you know, hiding their lights under a bushel here, because if you go back to um, your customers here, we're now robotizing our payroll and this is going to happen. And the company is going to say, well, in that case, if you're going to robotize what you're doing, why don't I just take what you're doing, do it myself? I don't need you to do it for me. Yeah, sure. I think that's one of the arguments that a lot of, uh, one of the reasons why a lot of the payroll companies keep what they're doing very, very close to the chest, to be honest, Nick. And, and you know, a lot of people, you know, in, in, in the last 20 years or so, they've outsourced for cost reasons. But nobody's actually insourced for cost reasons away from an outsourced environment. And one of the things that I came across and I've written about this for, for a couple of publications is, is if you're using robotics effectively in your peril department, when, why do you need to outsource it? Are you outsourcing it for philosophy reasons or would you do it for cost reasons? Because now it can be a situation where some companies could use robotics and actually do things cheaper than the outsourcer can. That's the secret why a lot of outsourcers typically aren't really keen to go public on what they're currently doing. And we've seen trends in recruitment. You know, you've been in the industry for 25 years, myself nearly 20, where, you know, the payroll industry tends to go in cycles. If suddenly everyone wants to outsource, then suddenly everyone wants to bring it back, then everyone wants to outsource again. And I've probably seen that cycle happen five or six times since I've been in it with different industry, different companies, yeah, getting, it in, getting it out. A new manager comes in and changes it again. So... It's very difficult to make the decision to insource once you've actually outsourced because, you know, you, you're in a status quo, you're in a long-term contract. Yeah. It's like putting a, you know, the, a kid's slide, you know, they go up the steps and the slide down the other end, and, but in between there's a wall. So you go up the steps, 
And once you get on the slide, you're the other side of the wall. It's very difficult to go back up the slide and over, you know, over on, on over the wall and back down the steps on the other side. And I've really never seen any company that have done that for purely financial reasons, uh, you know, come back over the wall. I've seen it for operational reasons or philosophy, but now using robotics, if a company is sensible how they approach the, the concept of robotics and AI, there is now a business case to be made for not outsourcing your payroll. If I was a payroll leader then, a payroll manager, head of payroll, payroll director, but perhaps listening to this podcast, or maybe I'm an HR professional, you know, responsible for, for payroll, and I'm listening to this payroll podcast, and I'm interested in implementing automation, robotics, or AI. Um, would I yeah. need to undergo a full HR payroll transformation program or, or ERP implementation to bring it in, or, or are there quicker, more manageable, or perhaps more affordable routes to market? This is a really key point, Nick. If you're going to undergo a, a robotics assessment, you do not need to implement a new ERP, new system, whatever. You're using the data and the process that's already in the product Okay. So there is no need to say, right, I'm going to robotize. I'm going to go out and buy success factors or work. There's a basis to do that. No, you don't need to do that. You can use what you've got and turn your head 90 degrees and look at it from a different angle. Look into what's simple and repetitive and what requires human intervention and look at what you've currently got and use that as a basis for transforming from inside the organization rather than doing it from outside. That's great advice. So you mentioned already that from a sales point of view, it's sometimes hard to demystify you know, what actually is being offered by some of the suppliers. But in relation to the developments in automation and robotics, do you think they're ultimately being designed at the moment to benefit the supplier or the customer in terms of the, the innovation behind robotics? From a payroll point of view, I would say that with the exception of one supplier, everything I've seen from other suppliers is, has been developed uh, with the primary intention of making internal processes more effective. I've seen one supplier that was very public about how uh, they were approaching robotics, and it was very much involving triangulation of payroll results to make sure that internal calculations, third-party calculations, and audit requirements were all triangulated to ensure they got to the same result. Uh, and I really thought their approach was absolutely superb. And they were very open to discussing that publicly, and certainly that proved the case in point where it no longer made a difference uh, whether they were doing it or they were worried about losing business. It actually made them uh, more competitive in the sales place by having a policy on and, and robotics that was actually going to benefit customers. So I'm very much a fan of suppliers sitting down with customers and saying, hey, this is what we're thinking of doing. Uh, why don't you try and work with us to help us make it more effective as part of our um, implementation process? Well, great. I was, that's, that's, a, that's a really interesting take on, on how, you, how you're viewing the market. And I don't think I know the answer to it because I don't get pitched to in, in that way as a recruiter. So it's interesting to see it from the other side of the fence. Obviously, with whichever way we look at it, the impact of AI and robotics is clearly going to be pretty immense on the payroll industry. It appears that ultimately AI is going to become the norm in many aspects of not just payroll, but HR as well. It's going to augment existing yeah. infrastructure. It's going to free up employees, as we talked about uh, focus hopefully on higher value strategic tasks if the more repetitive ones are being automated. So as a payroll and HR leader yourself, Martin, with two decades worth of experience, what strategic priorities do you think will take precedence then across the industry over the next 12 to 24 months? For me, a lot of people are talking about this, but a lot of people really, really don't have anything they can actually refer to as a product that will work with what their thoughts are. I would say a lot of companies really need to think very, very seriously about what they can achieve and what they what they want to achieve. And thinking about that with robotics and AI, it really is not quite as simple as it sounds. I mean, I found out when I, when I was working for a robotics manufacturer, I had to switch my mindset 90 degrees and look at everything from a different angle. And I think that can be quite difficult for a lot of H and peril functions because they're not used to, to approaching things in a very sort of binary way. You know, and it, it just requires a different mindset and thinking. It's not impossible. It took me, took me, I think, six weeks to get my head around what the robots could actually do and how they could do it. Sure. Because, you know, we all have a concept, I said, of like, you know, the Doctor Who Cybermen bouncing around the, the payroll yeah. office and clink, clink, clink. And a robot isn't that. A robot is a piece of software code that is pre-programmed to do a series of tasks. 
and you know you can have a few robots or you can have several robots and the robot can work with another robot it, it's all about how you think what you want the robot to do and how you want to what's your end desire for what your payroll department is trying to do. Is it trying to drive compliance? Is it trying to reduce cost? Is it trying to make the, the payroll experience a lot easier for the user? And I think there's, there's lots of ways that we can do that. You know, seriously, I'm, I'm a big fan of chatbots for HR and payroll. Yeah. You know, as I said, they can take the SLA down or the KPIs down from responding within 24 hours to instant response. I mean, I'm sat at home working on my Mac and I have some Mac software on here that uh, if I have a problem, I, I've got a chat mechanism on here. And I worked out once that it was like three to four interactions on the conversation before it actually got in, got to a human. Sure. I think that with chatbots have advanced so much. I think people still have this uh, mindset. They used to be like they were probably five five years ago or when we first started coming out and they were really clunk, clunky and unintuitive, but they've really changed since then. Yeah, you just got to think what you want to use it for. Look at what the questions and issues going into your help desk are. Identify those, move those into sort of like, are they to do with, with payments? Are they to do with calculations? Are they to do with, you know, simple things like I need a, I need, I need my last three months pay slips because my mortgage company needs to prove I'm da 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 da. You know what I mean? Sure. So think about, analyze what it is your payroll function is actually trying to do what support it gives to employees, what the interaction is with individual employees, and then work your chatbots around that. Uh, and don't take the first one that you see on the market. A lot of organizations are providing this technology and say, oh, yes, we do it for HR and payroll, but the reality is that they don't. So I'm, I'm very careful to work with my customers and say, look, Hey, just be very careful what you're going, to, what you're trying to do here. Make sure you you can prove that you're not just doing this to make it look good. good. It's got to have a, a valid reason why you're trying to put this in place. That's really good advice. There's something that I mentioned as well, probably a mistake of mine, but just to not to confuse any of the listeners at the moment is that obviously AI and robotics are two different things. Um, I know I kind of yeah. pulled them together and 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 generalised the two together in the last question, but ultimately, you know, they work. They can work together in a harmonious way, but actually. Utilization of robots isn't the same as bringing in AI. Um, so just to make that distinction clear, but perhaps you can make that distinction clear. Have you got an example of where the two work together in what you're doing at the moment, Martin? In terms of, of what they actually, what the difference is, AI is still, I, still for me, it's still a, a wish list and a desire item in many, many functions. I see more of that in HR rather than payroll, to be fair. I think that's fair. Yeah, because, you know, you're working on a recruitment system, you're working on a salary administration system. You know, you need to be very intuitive about what the process is. I mean, I, you know, I used to work for IBM, a very, very process-driven company, particularly for HR. So, you know, AI is proving to be very, very successful in that environment because it's interacting with the employees and it's forecasting and it's anticipating what employees are going to be doing, what they're going to be asking or needed. Payroll, it's less easy to justify the use of AI, to be fair, I, I think we've still got to get the, the approach for robotics to drive the compliance done first before we really start thinking about AI and payroll. I mean, that's my feeling at the moment. Well, that probably links back to the binary aspect of it. Automize, automization, you want it yeah. yes or no, as you don't necessarily want creative learning to, to take it somewhere where you don't want it to go, <laughs> where you don't want That's right. Think about what the robot is doing. The robot is doing everything inside the circle. The human is doing everything outside the circle. You know, the AI in some ways, machine learning is done outside the circle yeah. rather than inside the process. So in, in many ways, robotics and AI are actually two, you know, in many ways, separate items, I think. Sure, sure. Well, listen, we're going to find out a little bit more about your experience in robotics um, after we find out a bit more about yourself, because you have been involved in implementing uh, robotic solutions already. So that's going to come in section two. Before we get there, Martin, we're going to find out a little bit more about you. Time to find out more about you. So first things first, how would your friends describe you and how would your work colleagues describe you? <laughs> well, I work from home. I work alone. So ask my cats. <laughs> uh, how would my work colleagues find me? I know possibly fun, sometimes independent, typically Yorkshireman, a bit don't handle the the, uh, the crap and uh, wade through and, and stand on people's toes sometimes, but always with the best intentions, I would say, what my work colleagues would say. Fantastic. And what about something perhaps that you can tell the listeners that something people won't know about you? I was deported from Finland at gunpoint. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, God, tell me more about that, if you're able to. 
in this 80s, uh, I was doing some sort of consulting, executive coaching, consulting on communication skills. And I, I worked in Sweden and I had a work permit in Sweden and uh, my company transferred me to Finland. And Sweden's quite, quite less if I, in many ways. You, know, you get your work permit, da, 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 da. I crossed the border between Sweden and Finland, which is an open border on the, on a ferry and started my work in Finland. And I went to leave to go back to the UK for Easter. And they said, you don't have a work permit. What are you doing here? And they said, oh, your Swedish work permit's expired. So they called two guys with, you know, police with guns and they escorted me onto the plane and stamped my passport, said not to be readmitted to the country. Oh, God. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> no, I went back to the UK and I got a British visitor's passport and came back and worked on that for six months, then got a new new work permit and I was okay. But, you know, okay. two guys with heavily armed policemen with guns put me on an aeroplane and made sure that I didn't get off again. <laughs> That's kind of scary at the time. So, different question. If you were abducted by aliens and you want to learn more about our species, what item would you take with you? Probably my iPod. <laughs> music. So, what's, what's your favourite kind of music? I listen to anything, you know, Nick. I like a lot of the San Francisco stuff from the 60s and 70s, but there again, I can listen to some rap. I, I like Tupac. I'm a big fan of The Grateful Dead. I can listen to, to Wagner from classical music point of view. I'm quite open on that, and I think if I was with aliens, I'd say, hey, guys, sit down and listen to this type of music. You can learn so much from all this different stuff, I think. Fantastic. And if there was a game or instrument you could teach them, what would it be? Monopoly. Monopoly. God, this be a common answer, Monopoly. I never knew Monopoly was so popular. Tell me about Monopoly. Why Monopoly? Well, you know, people don't realise that Monopoly was built to discourage capitalism rather than to encourage it. So I think it's a fantastic game to show people's uh, um, malicious intent to rob people and to, um, you know, it brings out the worst in people. And that was the original intent of Monopoly. You know, you know I'm, from, I'm from Middlesbrough and there's actually a Teesside Monopoly or Middlesbrough Monopoly. Apparently, I read somewhere it's the most popular version of Monopoly in the country. Oh, really? I never, knew, I, yeah. I never knew the origins, so we're learning all the time here on the Pearl Podcast, which is good. So what would you tell aliens about humans? We believe in crazy things and don't make assumptions that we're easy to deal with because we're not. But I would say to them, look, we may all look different, but we're all the same underneath, I think would be the key thing I would say. Fantastic. I like that. And what human trait would you hold back? Selfishness, I would think. I wouldn't want aliens to learn how to become, the, how selfish we can be and how self-centered. I'd like aliens to think that we could function together and work together uh, right. as opposed to just thinking of ourselves all the time. Brilliant. Fantastic. Listen, we're going to dive back into the questions. We're going to go to a quick advert break and then we're going to find out a little bit more about your experience in terms of global payroll and also your transformation experience in terms of robotic solutions so stay with us einstein famously said that insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results we believe it's time to try a new approach to recruitment jga recruitment specialize in recruiting the top 15 percent of payroll and hr talent using innovative 24 7 attraction strategies that are proven to improve quality of hire candidate retention and return on investment de-risk your recruitment process today and hire better talent faster with jga recruitment Visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. Getting into the second section of questions here for you, Martin. I saw that Pay Asia recently announced its inclusion in Gartner's latest market guide for multi-country payroll solutions. So congratulations. Tell me how Pay Asia go about simplifying the complexity of global payroll for its clients. Uh, I know that the company has quite a unique approach to workforce consolidation. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean the Gartner thing is very, very important. You know, we're a public company now, so we are expected to be profiled with all the other big guys in the market. You know, if you read the Gartner reports, uh, it, they're very, very interesting. Uh, and sometimes I, I, you know, I look at statistics, what companies say, and I know some of them are, uh, you know, there's a lot of spin on those. But in terms of being involved in that Gartner thing, you, you know, it's a club you have to be part of to be able to have that global profile. And, and I'm really glad, but not surprised that Gartner are including um, us in that environment. I think that's a uh, testimony to what PayAge has achieved over the past uh, few years in terms of our success and everything else around it. Fab, fantastic. And as a, a payroll HR transformation expert, which you are, Martin, it, it must be quite scary or, or maybe it's really exciting, but for you to be able to witness firsthand the alarming speed that change is impacting on business at the moment, particularly global payroll, 
presumably it means from your perspective, it, it's more, and pay Asia's as well, but it's more crucial than ever that the business keeps up to date with latest trends so that you know, workforce transformation can keep pace. With this in mind, what advice would you give payroll and HR leaders if they ask you how they could stay ahead of the transformational change curve? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I would say don't put so much reliance on your HR solution to do that, but think about what workforce management can actually do for your business. I think workforce management is where the tangible uh, is much stronger than the intangible. And, you, and you know, no disrespect to the, to the big guys from, from their HR tools, but I think uh, you can contribute a lot more to the business by actually using workforce management to be able to drive the intelligence of how your organization is performing and how much it's actually costing. You know, one of the things I'm finding is that time management becomes much, much more prerequisite for a lot of organizations that it used to be in the past. You know, when I worked for SAP, I used to enjoy time management, you know, this negative and positive time management was, was part of SAP that I, I, I really like more than anything else. And primarily, I think that's because it's the tangibility of it as well. But also, it means, you, again, you can manage your your hours and your costs through the business. And I think a lot of the workforce management systems are uh, link better to payroll for that than actually HR systems do. So, you know, my advice would be, hey, look, you know, you might be looking for a new HR system, but maybe let's look at your business case, what you're trying to achieve. You know, if you're looking for a succession planning or whatever, or a new recruitment system, maybe what you need to do is think of the core product areas like workforce management and look at some more specific tools to do that rather than getting everything in one shop. I know that would be probably be my advice to the organizations is just think very, very carefully about your business case. Sure. And be able to prove the cost savings that you're putting through to your organization because quite often uh, I've seen situations where business cases get rewritten before the final selection because the selection doesn't actually match the initial business case it was written. Sure. If you had to break it down for, for someone perhaps pairing a business case, what would be the three or five key things that you would make sure they should consider before going to, to market? What would they be? What happens if you don't do this? These are my favorite. Yeah. So what's your imperative to do it? So what happens if you don't do it? Where's your organization going to be in five years' time? What's the company policy on use of technology? Have you got an organization that is going to be able to accept the change that this uh, transformation will put in place? And I think that's really, really key. I remember when I worked for IBM, you know, the, the HR director stood up and said, everybody wants to do, uh, you know, we're all going to put this HR transformation. And it was like watching a James Bond movie. You know, if you didn't like it, <laughs> the, the little button was pressed and, and you ended up in a pit full of crocodiles. <laughs> the chair went back. I think, you know, if you're going to put something in this, you've got to look for consensus across the business. And, and I'm very hot on driving compliance and getting consensus right. Because if you can't prove to the organization, these are the reasons why you must be doing this, then it's never ultimately going to succeed. Sure. You know, I've seen you know, the adoption rates of some of the products, you know, can be in low teens because nobody's actually sold the business benefits to the workforce or they've mandated the change without explaining to people how it's going to affect their jobs. So I think, you know, if you put this in a payroll context, I think it's very important that people understand the work of the payroll life cycle, bring the users in early to get involved in the adoption to make sure that they understand how this is going to make their work. And payroll people, no disrespect to them, uh, a lot of friends in payroll, but you know they can be quite reactionary and resistant to change in some ways. Yeah. But if the change is sold to them, then they can be some of the people that really, really embrace the, the new technology, new ways of working. And I think you know, in a, in a payroll environment, always, always, always involve the users in what you're trying to do. Sure. I think some of that resistance to change comes from if you've got a payroll, as you said at the start of this podcast, that's working, um, albeit maybe with some uh, some antiquated methods, but if it was working and people are getting paid on time, then sometimes people are reticent to change a process, even if they can make it more efficient. You know, it's kind of like if, if it's not broken, why, why fix it? It's knowing that you can continue and have that process that, that operates 10 times faster with the same accuracy and the same efficiency that, you know, that, that the people yeah, sometimes I'm resistant to take on those changes. Moving back to uh, the robotics side of things, I mentioned in my introduction that you know, you've worked for a major robotics provider in the past. You've advised clients on robotic strategy and you've helped organizations move to robotic solutions. Your responsibilities, if I understand it correctly, have included helping companies to 
define the products they need at a high level. So if I was a business yeah. interested in embracing robotics for payroll now, where should I start and what key things would I need to consider? I would say, why are you doing this and what would you like to achieve from this? And I would be very surprised if ultimately the answer wasn't to enforce compliance and accuracy would be the two key reasons. Yeah. I would say, look, let's look at how your current payroll landscape is. Let's look at your payroll life cycle per month or whatever per period and sit with the people and analyze what work they're currently doing. You know, I worked with one company about two and a half years ago where a big name company that were actually triple entering data from one client to another's to another. So they were acquiring businesses. They were taking the printouts of the data, rekeying it into one system, then getting a printout and rekeying it into another system. They weren't able to do all the interfaces. So I would say, look, what is it you're trying to achieve? How can we use technology to, to make that more effective and to increase your level of retention of key staff? Because I've seen payroll people walk out the door because they're either unhappy with the change or they're not seeing the benefits of what the organization is trying to do. Sure. So I think that's one of the things we need to look at. Fantastic. So last question then before we enter the vault. Why personally do you think, if you were selling it, um, do you think businesses and industry leaders should embrace transformational change, if indeed you should, in relation to automation, robotization and artificial intelligence? I think everybody wants to work in an environment where it's more efficient and it's more compliant and people actually enjoy what they're doing. I think one of the things that we would sell to payroll people is, look, if you're going to work this way, this is how your job will become much, much more easier and much more straightforward and therefore enjoyable and avoid you having the peaks and troughs in the payroll life cycle by keeping the activities in the life cycle fairly constant. So I think that's one of the key things is just sitting down with people and saying, look, if you do it this way, this is what you're going to do. But, you know, don't forget if you've got a situation, I had one of my clients where as I said before, if there being if there's no way of managing how much the overspend is in the payroll, then I think you know there's probably a, a little cold trail of sweat goes down most payroll managers back when they find yeah. out that people pay too much and they can't reclaim the money. Sure, sure. So I'm saying, look, you know, let's drive the compliance. Let's look at the business reasons to make this more equitable. Let's look at the payroll life cycle. Let's look at how technology can make your work more straightforward and easier and ultimately increase your credibility within your organization. You know, some payroll departments that make mistakes that tend to lose a little bit of credibility. Everybody wants to be the most popular people, you know, in the business. And I think payroll is never popular, but there's no reason why it couldn't be considered as effective uh, and error-free. And I think that's one of the key things I would, I would emphasize. Fantastic. I'm aware that I've asked you a lot of questions that date back to your, your early experience at IBM and all the experiences that you've, you've gained since in, in technology and project management and implementation and, of course, robotics. But if I was um, a payroll leader right now and I was looking for a new global payroll solution or provider and I had um, countries that, that, that cover the, the Asia-Pacific regions, you know, what would the reasons be that I might come to, to PayAsia? What, what could PayAsia offer a potential client? Local knowledge. The ability to interface with whatever back office HR system working with. Uh, I think those are the two key reasons that our technology environment is, is very, very sweet. It works really, really well. But I think one of the key things is, is given that we've got great pricing and great technology and local coverage. I think one of the key things is that, that we are a, a great company to work with. And I think people like to buy from people ultimately. I've sat in RFP presentations, customer demonstrations, you know, and I've felt the sales spin, you know, and it's, it makes me laugh sometimes. And I think if any organizations working with, with our company, I think they'll find that it's an honest, accurate, equitable approach to working with experts that are able to provide the right service at the right time in the right environment in Asia. Fantastic. Look, it's probably a separate debate for another podcast, but I, it's something I'm hearing a lot is, there are some of the bigger businesses seem to put a lot of investment into shiny, fancy sales presentations uh, where some perhaps the feedback yeah. I'm getting is they should probably be putting more investment into the service and the product behind those presentations rather than the presentations themselves. Yeah. So I think that's a really good point. Well, mate, but as we're going to enter the vault. Entering the vault. One piece of advice, Martin, you would give to someone working in payroll right now. 
<laughs> oh, oh, there's many pieces of advice. It depends what their issues would be, I would think. But uh, anybody working in payroll should think about ways in which their tasks could be much more effective. And to give them a smoother working payroll cycle is to think about how technology could make what would you really want your technology and your payroll system to do for you to make your work easier? Fantastic. That would be my question. Fantastic. With the benefit of hindsight, what would be the one career decision you would change? <laughs> oh, there's been several. I've worked with <laughs> some, some players. I walked off a contract once um, because I felt concerned about my personal safety when I was working in the Philippines. Yeah. People were carrying guns, and I was working for a client that, was not concerned with uh, our personal safety and I just gave up and I just walked away and I never went back. I probably shouldn't have done that. I probably should have stuck it out a little bit longer, tried to solve the problem before walking off, but I was concerned about my own personal safety. And, you know, we're not paid to, to, in the payroll consulting environment, we're not paid to worry about who's going to rob us when we walk out the office on a night. No, sure. I probably sort of said, Sodju, I'm not going to do this anymore a little bit quicker than I probably should have done. But, you know, you work in an environment where you say, can you call us a taxi, takes back to the hotel, and the customer says no. Then, you know, you know, it's a very, very difficult environment to be in. And I probably did walked a little bit quicker than I should have done. I, I probably should have stuck it out a little bit longer. That was probably my major mistake. Uh, sounds pretty understandable from where I'm sitting. <laughs> I think I'd have done the same as you. It was an impetu impetuous, oh, sorry, I'm not prepared to be sat here. And I think I, what happened, I'd flown in from wherever it was, and I spent, they knew I was waiting to start. I'd been working there three or four months and they kept me waiting in reception for three hours on a Monday morning. And they knew I was there. And, you know, I did that to my personal safety. I just said, stuff it, I'm not prepared to stick this any longer. And um, I probably shouldn't have done that so quickly as I did, but that's probably my major mistake, I think. Well, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, uh, good for you. <laughs> if you had the power of foresight and could change the entire payroll industry, one action or improvement, what would that action or improvement be? I'm really having to think through that one. Use technology better would be my key advice. I think that's what I would say. Just don't be afraid of what can be achieved sure. um, would be my advice. I think that's been very much supported by the uh, the content in this podcast that you very articulate, articulately put through. So uh, that's a great point to make. Who motivates you and why? Who motivates me? Yeah. I've worked with several people in, in my working career that, have had what I call the President Clinton complex. You'd have followed them to the ends of the world, uh, to the edge of the cliff, and then they'd stop, step back and let you, you know, jump over the cliff and watch you fall. What motivates me is working with people that treat people like humans and show care and consideration for their fellow employee and realize that they are people. And I find that the older I get, the more motivated I am by people that, that treat each other like people. And that's why I, I enjoy my current role in PayAsia so much. It, you know, we are part of uh, an organization that's working in several different continents, but uh, we are treated like people in a people environment. And uh, I really find that motivates me. Very, very important in my working career. Less so when I was younger, but as I get older, you know, the, the people side of thing becomes less a cliche and more a desire. Sure. Sure. Well, that's a fantastic response. So last question before we finish the podcast, Martin, if you didn't work in payroll, what would you be doing? <laughs> well, when I left university in 1980, I applied for a, a Master of Arts course at York University in medieval history because that was my joy and still is. I, I still love uh, English medieval history. And my local council wouldn't give me a grant. Okay. And I said, what will you give me a grant for? And they said, well, how about doing personnel management? And I said, well, what's all that all about then? <laughs> so I, I, so they gave me the money. That was the only thing they would give me funding for. And that's why my career went off in this direction. But, you know, given a parallel universe, I would have become a lecturer in history and I'd probably be sat in some very nice American university now earning a huge amount of money for writing books that nobody would ever read. <laughs> all about the dark ages. I've been trying to work my way through War of the Roses by Con Igledon. It's been a... Very good, but some inaccuracies. The Wars of the Roses is what I specialised in, actually. Okay, yeah, I'm, um, I find it good. It's, it's, it's a good book. It's, it's quite a big, it's quite a meaty one to get through. I've been on it for about six months, but I'm enjoying it. I, I'm a big fan of Con and I've read all of his Rome series. So yeah, he's very, very good. I absolutely agree. Yeah, he's great. I haven't actually read that one, but I will get round to it. Um, the Wars of the Roses is what I spent two years studying. So 
Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm a Yorkshire. Big fan of Richard the Third, of course. <laughs> well, we could have had that in the, the uh, little bit about you section as well. Well, listen, I want to take this opportunity, Martin, to say a huge thank you for joining me today on the Payroll Podcast. Um, obviously, I will put lots of links to both Pay Asia and your LinkedIn profile, if I may, so people can find out more about the business. Um, just to quickly summarise, Pay Asia were founded in 2006. They're headquartered in Singapore. They're a leading provider in the Asia Pacific region for fully managed payroll and cloud HR services and solutions, and where they try to meet the demands of clients for process and technology driven regional solutions and consolidation. And on their website, which is payasia.asia, you can find out a lot more about the services, as I say, which range from multi country international payroll, consulting, compliance, security, lodgement services, treasury functions, and more. So please do take a look if you have a moment. I'll also put a link to Martin's LinkedIn page should you wish to contact Martin about further services at PayAsia. Um, and apart from that, just want to say a huge thank you for, for joining me today. It's been a whirlwind tour of robotics in payroll with probably the most senior or experienced robotics professional I know working in this space. So thank you ever so much for joining me, Martin. You're very welcome. Thanks, everybody. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I will speak to you all again in a couple of weeks. You've been listening to the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, specialist payroll recruiters. If you would like to feature on a future podcast, please contact us. For a wealth of world-class payroll content, please visit us at jgarecruitment.com. See you next week.